All right, Bismillah, uh, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, all praise is for God, who is the creator and the originator of the heavens and the earth, and uh, peace and blessings upon all his messengers. Uh, I have, uh, uh, Reverend, can you please introduce yourself, if you don't mind? Okay, so I am uh, Maverick. I was, you know, I come from a very Anglican um background and that that's why I was ordained as a as a reverend so people still call me by that name mm. uh, I made I defected so to speak to the Eastern Orthodox tradition um, just through my own study of the scriptures and stuff and yeah it's been a, an interesting ride because uh, what actually got me to studying theology was comparative religion mm. so um, yeah world you're religion, studying Islam, comparative so, religion so you're like you know, yeah 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 um, um, I yeah, I, I've got these, I, I, I treat this as my textbook for Islamic studies, the study Quran, and uh, <laughs> um, and I've got a few other books, I mean, I've got Al-Ghazali, uh, I've got some other stuff here, and so I'm, um, as, as much as, um, you know, I study Christian theology, and I'm a devout Christian in the Eastern tradition, I have tried to... Um, to actually interact um, with with other people from other faiths, um, and Muslims are a key player in that in that entire uh, mm. a synergy, for lack of a better word, of me trying to speak to other uh, people and saying, "Hey, let's let's actually speak together," because I think we're going to need that in the in the future, where it seems to be that the world is losing their mind and um, and actually. Uh, Contrary to what most atheists think, religion is not dying. Um, I, I see a, a definite need for people reconsidering the, uh, the importance of faith and spirituality as something that's becoming quite integral. Now, in, in, in some instances, it's definitely scary because uh, paganism is... Uh, regaining its yeah, magic in Europe. paganism all of that yeah and all of that stuff that people would have considered superstitious um yeah is is becoming uh common i mean in in south africa where i'm from uh, buddhism is definitely skyrocketing in its in its prominence and i mean as someone who's currently uh living in east uh, east asia in south korea um, I actually have started even consulting Buddhism is the other comparative religion that I'm uh, interacting with. But but obviously, um, I, I, I say this like off the bat, there's a there's a relationship I have to Islam that was always there as a child because I was raised in a very pluralistic uh, mm. environment. Um, my mother's family was Roman Catholic and Muslim. So uh, mm. I obviously was exposed to all, all of those things. And um, yeah, I, so sometimes people are like, wait, wait, are you a Muslim? And I was like, why would you say that? And that was because you understand what we're speaking about. And I was like, well, I, I consider myself an ally of the, uh, of the Muslim people and a friend. So mm. that's, what, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and, and uh, likewise, uh, I'm very happy to, learn about the so many similarities that we share uh, as Muslims mm -hmm. and because you know the world is facing with uh, such darkness in terms of godlessness and in terms of liberalism and having no values and breakdown of society and I'm here in the US right like in the center of it like you know where the the, the ghettos uh, are kind of like uh, so, you know, I see that. I see the homelessness. I see the uh, lack of spirituality. I see it every day in the streets and in, in the people's lives. No direction, uh, no motivation, sometimes no, um, you know, and then women, uh, the whole, uh, the women's liberation kind of like uh, where it goes against to the point where it goes against family and family life and harmony within family and so I'm very, I was very happy um, to see the, the traditional values that, uh, that Eastern Orthodox Christianity kind of is trying to uphold uh, compared to uh, 
you can call Santa Claus, Santa Claus Christianity, um, or uh, compared to Christianity that, you know, is okay, it's just, it's, it loses all its principles as a religion. I mean, even though the religion is there. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a moral crisis in, um, in the West right now. And um, this is why Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy in the Assyrian Church of the East, these more older branches of Christianity are gaining prominence because the, the West is losing its mind. It's, it's quite clear. And um, one of my favorite uh, scholars of religion, David Bentley Hart, said he, he does, he's not even convinced that Christianity has really made it to the shores of America. Um, and this is his criticism of just the, the, the uh, so, so I, I, I come from the um, Anglican, continuing Ang Anglican world, which is an offshoot from Episcopalianism. I mean, if, if, if I go into a church right now, I, I don't even know um, the moral stance of all of that. And I mean, uh, if, if you look at some of the books, let me see if I have a book uh, where Rainbow Theology, um, oh. Uh, this is this is uh, written by an Episcopalian priest, uh, very very liberal. Because um, and some of the things that I couldn't even imagine would have been allowed for me to do in my an undergraduate work in theology, where he's speaking about some indecent sexual acts hmm. um, as being part of of what it means for him to be a Christian. So, I mean, if you know anything about the history of English Christianity, Anglicanism. Um, there was a point where they were very orthodox, conservative, and um, uh, where they actually thought through these things. And I mean, there are a lot of brilliant Anglican theologians, but today, I mean, it's 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 very very warped. Um, mm -hmm. It's like the, the, I mean, some of some of the churches are just not Christian anymore. It just openly. I mean, there there there's another group. Uh, the um, the ELCA, um, Evangelical Lutheran, Lutheran Church, um, and it, that is very, very mind-numbing. Um, and sometimes we are like, is this a Wiccan coven? Mm. You know, some kind of, because it's really bizarre. Um, it doesn't bear any relation to uh, what you would have considered uh, a normal expression of traditional Christianity in any way, shape, or form. So, yeah. Um, and, I, and I saw that. I saw that. Um, right. And so one of the stand. things that, you know, really uh, made me happy and surprised me, uh, maybe if you could talk about that a little bit, is that when I saw how women in the churches were covering their head, you know, oh. the, the whole, <laughs> like modesty actually exists other than Islam in another religion, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, if you, I, I know that, um, that I, like pretty sure iconography of 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 the prophets are, are haram in, in 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 islam but but um just for a point of reference if you come into an orthodox church you'll notice that there's always a picture of mary yeah and mary would be wearing this head covering um yeah. that's what we remember of the blessed virgin um and when you when you look at all of the at the, the way that women are dressed, uh, the, like some people are like, is that an hijab? Uh, because uh, <laughs> they they covered with their heads. And there's actually a passage in First uh, Corinthians eleven that it says, for this reason, a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Um, let me just get that in the NASB. Therefore, the woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So basically what the apostle is speaking about in this passage, it's speaking about the fact that when you go earlier on in the, uh, in the intertestamental literature and you look at um, the book of Genesis, uh, some of the, we, we call them the, the ben, El, ben Elohim, uh, the sons of God or mm. the angels, depending, but I'm not mm. going to break open. They were lusting after women um, and they were obviously attracting unnecessary mm. attention Mm. Uh, to themselves which was which was arousing in men all, all sorts of sexual passions and lusts and um and we we can speak about the nephilim they were the product of human and angelic union mm. um which were they were obviously an abomination in that sense um and because of that uh, paul says you know you should 
cover your head, do that, uh, because that's modesty. Um, because also in, in, in that sense, you are covering up the beauty of a woman. Um, and in, in that same passage, in, uh, in, in the same book, it speaks about, you know, how uh, if a woman that shaves her head, that's dishonorable. Um, it's, it's a dishonor to a head and it says, but if a man cuts his hair, that's an honor to him. Mm. And I'm not going to get into the cultural perception of that, but, um, co woman cover covering their head is, um, uh, um, sorry, my, uh, so sounds calling me, um, <laughs> um, anyways, what, what, what is that? Okay. Uh, I'll just have to, uh, uh, sorry, that was like a plim, 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 plim. Oh, praise God. Um, he's good. And uh, I where was I? Okay, so the, the entire thing that Paul goes on is about how, you know, it's honorable to cover your head and um, it's also a symbol of authority. Um, and... Yeah, that's basically the, uh, the, the reasoning. It's modesty is a good thing because it arouses not only in men, but spiritual entities. The Melachim look at this yes. and they're like, oh, we like that. And yeah. um, Actually, we have uh, the same idea. It, it's called the jinn. And if, the, if uh, a woman is alone and she's beautiful and she's walking in the street or somewhere in the shayateen, the jinns or the, the, the devils, mm -hmm. Uh, the concept that we have in Islam, they will attach themselves to somebody who has a beautiful voice or beautiful hair or beautiful looks. And uh, then that will affect her spirituality and so on and so forth. And um, there's, there's actually some, because before I was in what we call apostolic Christianity, um, I was part of the, the Pentecostal movement. Um, uh, but in, if you're looking at classical Pentecostalism, a woman would cover the heads too. Um, and actually very interesting in that particular yeah, church that I was a part Pentecostals of. Pentecostals that we have in America, they're also a little bit more conservative than the others. Oh, and we would We would take our shoes off in worship. Yeah, um, that happens in some orthodox environments too. Um, and this is all based on something in the Bible where where the prophet Moses, uh, where there was a burning bush, um, God says, take off your shoes. Yes. Take off That's your shoes because of war. In the Quran too. Yeah. Inna kabi wa situa. Take off your shoes. You're in the holy place. And so that's interesting. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so obviously for Eastern Orthodox Christians, we don't think you can just walk into the church. We, and I mean, this is another thing between Islam and Orthodox Christianity that we share with um, ancient Judaism, this idea of ritual purity. Hmm. Um, if I have a, a wet dream, uh, a nocturnal emission, um, I am unclean technically by the Levitical standards in the Bible and uh, I need to purify myself. Hmm. Um, the ritual uh, washings were very common in the New Testament time. Yeah, and, I mean, um, ask for water all the time, and they're washing his feet, they're washing his head, right? That's like, oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I it was very common plastic. for, yeah, during about around about the Lent time, uh, that we have a, a thing called the washing of feet. Mm -hmm. So, um, in, 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 in some writings of the fathers, uh, the washing of feet are actually considered as a renewal of baptism. Mm -hmm. um, at least I think it was in patristic literature. Yeah. And so, um, uh, Peter and Jesus are actually conversing. Now, P Peter has a very interesting uh, legacy in the, in the New Testament, but uh, he says, he's obviously very annoyed that the rabbi gets to wash his feet. He says... Uh, uh, Jesus, you should never wash my feet. And, uh, and Jesus is, uh, unless I wash you, you will be unclean. Mm -hmm. And, and Peter gets very excited and he says, well, then wash all of me, Lord. And, uh, and Jesus says, uh, you have already been washed. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. calm down, calm down. You only need your feet to be washed again. Because I mean, back in the time of, of Jesus Christ, they would have the, you know, dust and soil caked on their feet um and they needed to wash their feet so um that, uh, yeah and um when women are 
at that time of the month in the during the period mm. they would they are not allowed to actually partake of the sacrament the mm. bread and the wine they're not allowed to partake of the the eucharist in fact in because we believe that this is a sacrifice the sacrifice of bread and wine um we don't believe that usually like the, the priest will not be with his um with his wife for that for that time because there's also publicly uh the day is from evening to evening mm -hmm. so um so uh we, yeah, we do believe Islam. in the shabbat mm -hmm. yeah 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 and i i think uh the eastern orthodox church uses the lunar calendar the same way yeah the the, the, the issue of a calendar is an interesting uh because uh yeah uh there are two usages of the calendar actually um, you have the Russians that are a lot more conservative, and then you have some other, like the the Greeks that will use the the new calendar. And so this is this has caused some splits in some areas where we have what we call the the true Orthodox and the old believers. Very controversial, um, but uh, yeah, this is this this was an issue where they the, the calendar was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just okay, you know. So. Um... Okay, so we have a lot of commonalities, and in this time, yeah, uh, just a, a, another thing that I probably that is probably exciting is that um, we always face east, or we try to face east. When oh, we're okay. Worshiping. Yeah, um, because we understand that Jesus will come from the east, hmm. so we we expect his return. And when you come into an actually um, in this app that I have. Uh, when you go onto the app, it actually shows you where East is in the room. <laughs> so you can face that when yeah. you pray. We have this and, thing um, Pros called the Qibla, which will tell us where North, I mean, wherever the East is, the, the Kaaba. And so, so very, very, very interesting because um, when we are doing the prostrations and stuff, um, so, sometimes that they, they are, I, I know in the Syrian church, um, they still have prostration. So they would do the sign of the cross and they would do a prostration that would look to people like they're Muslim. Because remember, the Orthodox churches have guys who are bearded and all of a sudden they do this and they start doing it. It's like, so is this Muslim? Like, what, what's going on here? Right, yeah. um, and I've, I've heard a, an accusation from a man that said, you Orthodox people are just Muslims with crosses. And mm -hmm. it's like, and uh, there was a, a very funny meme where the... Um, Obviously, an uh, Orthodox nun was walking by, and this Protestant comes by, and he's like, "Oh, it's a Muslim!" And then she's like, "I am an Orthodox nun," and the guy's like, "Ah, oh, it's a Catholic," because we kind of <laughs> not on that, uh, you know, in, in that spectrum, so they don't really know what to do with us. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's so funny. So, um, so okay, so we have a world that doesn't even know god right for the most part like the the, the globalized world uh, doesn't uh, connect with god in the way that maybe we see connection with god to lower ourselves debase ourselves or try not to be arrogant um try to uh, you know uh not be too fleshly i guess would be a term not to be of the flesh or not to be of the world um that's completely opposite to the culture, the globalized culture that we have. And so when you have uh, a group of people, even though they may have a difference of faith, but they still love God as God deserves to be loved, or they want their life to be under the will of God. Um, that's a very refreshing thing, like from a Muslim's perspective, to kind of like see that we're not the only ones uh, is I think very refreshing uh, for me as a Muslim. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, there's some writings of some philosophers and some thinkers from the, 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 the Eastern Orthodox church that also give a very strong perspective. So it's like we can share perspectives because we have so much in common. Um, let me, so, so that's, that's why it's, it's, you know, when it comes to, uh, things like protecting our families, traditional values, uh, having a godly life. So these are things that are common between us. And they put us in, so the reason this becomes important is that 
we have, for example, Muslims who, even though they're Muslims and born Muslims, but they're more part of that other culture uh, where they are involved in a culture of the here and the now and the culture of the world. And even though they're born Muslims, but they don't have that vibe, they don't have that color, um, that culture, that attitude, uh, because they're so lost in their corporate America jobs and you know, and you have a wife who's arguing with her husband, why should I listen to you? Or why should I wear a covering over my head? Because they're so, so meaning even though if somebody's born Muslim or in your case, if somebody's born Eastern Orthodox Christian, what the West is offering is so vastly different and deceptive at the same time um, that we actually, a, a, in s- some perspectives, a, a practicing Muslim and a practicing Eastern Orthodox Church member have more in common than a Muslim that's out there in the world who doesn't remember God and doesn't yeah. care about God and thinks religion is backwards. And Yeah, we, we actually have a passage in the Bible that says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Um, so, um, so they know, because I, I believe everyone knows that God is, um, but we have this internal drive with our sins and we like, no, 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 blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear that God stuff. You see, um, I can remember, um, I had a very, very, um, good Muslim, Muslim friend, um, her name, uh, it was actually a female, so uh, it, it was kind of funny because people thought that we were dating, but obviously we were, we were, that, that, that wasn't the case, we were just good friends, and we were actually very interested in one another because of faith relations and stuff, and uh, um, people would get very annoyed when we speak about God. Um, and, you know, Jesus, Jesus actually says, you are the light of the world, he, said, he also says, you are the salt. And what, what, what does that mean? If, if I take a salt and I put it on an old wound, what does it do? It irritates. Mm. And so this is exactly what we were doing. We were too salty for the unbelievers. Um, and, the, and these people really do know God, but they always give you excuses like, yeah, I'm, I'm not really into religion. I'm just kind of... I'm know, so spiritual, and, but I'm not religious. Yeah. Or I'm yeah, spiritual which, which is and I don't follow organized religion. Which, which is a very nonsensical thing to say because, um, you know, the Christians, especially in the in the Protestant uh, tr- tradition, but more the low hanging fruit, they'll be like, "I oh, don't, don't give me religion, give me Jesus." And I was like, "What on earth does that mean?" Um, that that absolutely meaningless sentiment. And I understand that there are things which are done in the name of religion, but if we if we are irresponsible and we we doing things because we feel, you know, we want to make ourselves feel better about it, we often tend to, you know, want to push back at it. But I think, um, and you know, Jordan Peterson, very famous uh, Christian, uh, not Christian, um, but just a social commentator and psychologist. Um, you, you, you know, when you, if you go to a sports stadium while the game is being played, or if you go to uh, just any place, like if you go to the comic book store and stuff, the people are having religious experiences with these yeah. objects. And um, this is what they don't even know. Re- we are so wired to be religious. That is not, that's not even, um, that's actually funny that people try to resist this urge. But um, if people go to a heavy metal show and they marshing and stuff, they are having this religious encounter mm. with the transcendent reality. And just like, you guys just don't want to call it religion, but that's exactly what it is. Mm. Um, Interesting. <laughs> and it's like uh, you, 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 you say that we religious people are weird. Um, I, I, I feel as though, yeah. So I want very, to go back to, um, we were talking earlier before this recording, um, we were talking yeah. about Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his encounter with Christianity and you were commenting on mm-hmm. the type of so if you want to please expand upon that. Um. So, um, so obviously, 
when Muhammad, the peace be upon him, was receiving uh, the, 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 the revelations, um, there are certain things uh, that, he, that he said and he interacted with, but it seems to me that um, the, the people that he was speaking to came from uh, these different you know, perspectives and stuff. Um, like we actually have some people who don't believe that, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying whether or not I agree with it or not, so that's just, but it, it, it seems like he was speaking to some people who didn't have the same understanding, maybe, uh, you, you know, some, some of the Gnostics, um, and the, the Gnostic, the Gnostic infancy gospel, for example, there's a similar account in the Quran, um, you know, of Jesus in the cradle speaking out and uh, pro, 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 proclaiming these things. Um, and uh, there, there are certain things that Muhammad speaks about that have been like, wow, where did he hear that from? Because that's mm. actually a thing. Mm. So it's not like we, we like the, 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 like Muhammad, peace be upon him, was making the stuff up. There was real interaction. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to speak about this because I don't have a lot of knowledge about it. But if you're reading through Sai al-Bukhari and um, the various treaties that Muhammad made, um, you know, and, you know, being a member of the Quraysh tribe and stuff. And I mean, what was very, very fascinating to me is that um, uh, if, if, if anyone is interested, there is actually a Catholic theologian who is trying to... Um, who, who weighs in on how Christians can have a kind of a reception to Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. It's a book called Muhammad Reconsidered, a Christian Perspective on Islam Prophecy by Anne Bonta Morland. She's from a Roman Catholic perspective. And um, mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, nuances about this, about pr because prophets didn't see. So uh, it, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, the, the 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 term of a prophet so where we we have the intertestamental pre period which is usually assumed to have been a time of silence when god didn't speak uh, but then later on in the the new testament in acts 2 it speaks about you know they spoke with other tongues and they were prophesying and there was this concept that um that a believer in god could prophesy and so in first corinthians 14 1 it speaks about speaking in tongues in this prophecy so there's almost like a scholarly attempt right now in christianity to try and see to try and receive as much as we can from the islamic tradition without compromising our own ummah mm -hmm. and so uh it's uh, very very important for us um to to, to consider these the, these perspectives and um yeah it's, it's it's very interesting because um in 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 the study Quran, obviously, uh, as as a Christian, I I disavow any concept that I practice shirk uh, mm. because I don't have any. They, they, they are two creeds fundamental to the Christian faith. Ya Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Shema Israel, Adonai Alawinua, Adonai Echad. You know, mm. the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord, that the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And we have that that similar uh, thing where in First Corinthians eight six, for to us there's only one God, the Father. And so um, actually, when you read what the Quran says, the Holy Quran says, there is a lot of discussion that can be had. And um, when you're looking at uh, the surahs two and four, where, uh, you know, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, um, say not three, um, there, there is a heresy in the Christian church called tritheism where, um, and Mormons actually believe in a form of tritheism where they're saying that it is God and the goddess mother mm -hmm. and uh, this, this kind of thing where it seems like what the, the prophet peace be upon him was saying was a rejection of some Christian heresies more than it was about the people of the, bu the book, the Alal Injil themselves. Mm -hmm. So I feel as though there's a lot of reconsidering because I think Muslims and Christians have spoken past each other and we have reprimanded one another. And if we can take fr from the Alexandrian way of, 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 of reading scripture, I believe that they are, there's so much that we haven't touched because we have regarded our communities in suspicion. Mm -hmm. But now we have scholarships and, you know, we, 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 we have Christians who are actually starting to care what the Islamic world is saying and vice versa. And as Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said, um, it is, and, and, and unfortunately, in the um, in the Abrahamic world, we tend to have the syndrome where we think we have a monopoly of the truth. 
Hmm. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, I don't have the truth. The church, the church, we believe the church has the truth, but, but God has the monopoly on the truth. Hmm. It's very interesting that when Paul in the book of Acts, when he's dealing with the pagans, um, and if you study comparative religion and religious epistemology, he says, he says, but this God that you call the unknown God, that is the God I'm speaking about. Hmm. And um, there, there's this sense, and um, David Bentley Hart has a book coming out right now. Um, I, I pre-ordered it, You Are God, um, uh, on, on the issue of nature and supernature, where all religious epistemology epistemologies that oh, at least most of them seem to come back to that fundamental principle of the belief in the one the god who is the source of all all good things and um yeah and uh, it's very very interesting also when you're speaking about issues of christology because um uh in the west and the east there are different understandings of the trinity um uh where when we when we say that you know that god is one we are speaking about the father who is the source and fountainhead of divinity and the study quran actually speaks about that which is why i love this resource because it's actually interacting with some of the things that we say when when we say things like jesus is god i think it is misleading because um the english english has so many misleading connotations Hmm. Um, we are speaking about Jesus as the eternal logos. So um, in Islamic uh, thought, the Islam is eternal. Am I correct? Uh, the, the mother al-Qatub, uh, the, the mother book. Yeah. Uh, can, can you explain? Yeah, I mean, the Quran so, is so, eternal. Yeah. The word of God. So we, by logos, so we actually, if I remember correctly, logos means the word, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And this so is logos something means the word, and so the word that. is eternal. Yeah, and so we say, and so when we speak about Jesus being God, and this is this is, this is kind of uh, we speak about Jesus being Theos. We are not saying he is the Father. He's, there's only one God, the Father. We are saying that Jesus is the eternal Logos who becomes incarnate in the person of Jesus, and so he is the perfect expression, similar to um, to the M Muhammad, peace be upon him, being the perfect man. Who, uh, so we say that Jesus uh, exudes that beauty of God, where if we want to know what God is like, the nature of, uh, of, 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 of Jesus Christ, whom we also believe is a prophet, by the way, um, is, uh, is, is preeminent in showing what God is like. And so um, do we believe that there, there is a radical sect, the Mormons, the LDS church, to believe that, uh, I can't even say it, that that the that the Lord had um, a sexual relationship with Mary, but that is haram to a Christian. That is a heresy. Right, right, right. We we disavow it as strongly as you do. We don't believe when we use terms like God as the Father. This is a concept of, that needs to be caveated with um, apophatic theology. We don't believe that God is in sexual relations, um, and we we strongly affirm that there was no sexual union between God the Father and the Blessed Virgin. And um, th these are very, I think, things that get tend to overlook because I think the outrage Muslims have at some of these things. It's like, well, we don't believe it either. It's like, <laughs> we don't, we don't believe that crazy stuff. Um, and so, I think philosophically, if so, you get yeah, into for, what Christian, if I can believe, just, yeah, if you don't mind, the whole yeah. logos thing is interesting to me because it's very, at least in my mind, as I'm getting information mm -hmm. from you and trying to Islamize it, you can say in my mind. It's very similar to uh, that, that something existed in the Logos, meaning his command or his word, meaning the word of God is his mm -hmm. command. And so the way we would understand that is that Jesus was a command of God, a word of God. And he said, be, and then it manifested mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and the word of God is eternal. So mm -hmm. uh, that is not to say that anything that God manifests it becomes eternal. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I don't know if I'm on the right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, there, there is a controversy in the early church and um, the, the Council of Nicaea takes issue where mm -hmm. uh, the Bishop Arius or Arianius, or depending on how you want to say it, but Arius was saying that uh, the Logos was just a God he was, um, uh, and and he was condemned as a heretic. The, the because what he, he said that there was a time when the word was not. 
So this is haram to a Christian's ears. We say that the word is the mediating principle of the incomprehensible God the Father. Hmm. And so Jesus Christ, the enfleshment of that word, is both divine and human. I use the term divine and human because uh, just for... But, uh, this is a this is a concept that is picked up in the Jewish concept of the two powers in heaven. Um, the two powers in heaven was basically the idea that whenever God draws near, it was through his intermediary, uh, the logos. Um, and in Proverbs 8, it speaks about the Lord has founded me at the beginning of his way. And so the word is but is not God. It, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a strange thing. And so to a, to a Christian mind, when we say God in three persons, the term persons is a deceptive term. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, again, English at its best. English cannot correspond to you the inheritance of the Christian tradition. It is, it, it, it is misleading. And so when I, I never use that word because I don't want to scandalize people into thinking that I believe in a three-headed God because I don't. So, That's, so, that, um, so your point so, is very strongly that, that I want my audience to understand is that you are inherently Tawhidic, meaning you believe in one God, which kind of separates unambiguously, you from, which kind of yeah. separates you from Western Christianity, in a sense. Um, we 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 have a criticism of um, the Western models. I, at least I have a criticism of the Western models, where um, certain issues, the way in which it is spent, actually leads them to believing that there are three self-existent ones, um, and so this is a very very controversial topic and i mean um david bentley art has a book tradition and apocalypse where he speaks about this whole issue um but when we say jesus is god um we are not saying he's the father we are saying that he is the eternal word and wisdom of god that has always been and so god didn't acquire his wisdom somewhere in time it's always been and so um, there, there's also this concept of a metaphysical issue of, you know, Sat Chitananda, which is a Bhavad Gita concept, you know, Brahman, um, you know, the, this concept that, uh, that Father, Son and Holy Spirit or Father, Word and Holy Spirit are um, the Father is the source and fountainhead. And we see the Word and the Holy Spirit as the two um, I there, there's a there's an early church father that called this the two arms of God, mm. the way he relates to his creation. And so there's always one God that is a negotiation, non, uh, that, but there are other beings. And unfortunately, uh, there, there are other beings who are called gods, Elohim. Mm. But um, again, it's 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 because of the way that English has it works. It's not a very easy thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things that are Elohim, but uh, they are not of the same. They are not like the, the, the Bible says there's none like him. Yeah. Um, well, they're not of in, the in same fact, substance, in, if I would use a Roman. Yeah, term. that is. Yeah, that is. That is. That is. Uh, no, they cannot be of the same substance. It would be uh, it would because the, 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 the substance of God is incomprehensible. Mm. Um, the, it, you, you, you could never make sense. Now, I'm not going to say that there isn't disagreement between Islam and Christianity. I'm not going to say that. Hmm. But I am going to say is that um, we are not that wacky as, um, as is sometimes unfortunately said about, you know, young high schoolers who speak about these things on, on YouTube and they think this is what the Christian doctrine is. In fact, I want to I wanna say this too. In fact, even some in the Western paradigm are letting go of um, these ways of speaking. We don't say God is three, three persons. We say there are three hypostases. Hmm. And the one who pustas is the father is the source and fountainhead of divinity and the, the wisdom and um, ruach um, hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, are the ways that God interacts hmm. with, his, with his creation. And they are all eternal. But we also say they have an origin. This is what's called the eternal generation of the sun and the, uh, the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. But in all of those issues, it is very fundamental that there is one divine nature. This is um, anything else is a deviance from holy orthodoxy. Mm. Um, and there's also discussions about um, is, is Jesus then auto theos, the self existing God? Um, and we say yes and no, in the sense that he has the same, uh, the, as, that the word is of the same stuff as God, yes. 
but only because he's inseparable. The word is inseparable from God. But at the same time, um, he derives his being from the father, the source of being. That's why he says, I do nothing of myself. Mm. Um, I only do what the father does. And uh, yeah. And so this is a, a very, very complex, I think, metaphysical yeah, yeah. issue. It's, it's but kind of like think... uh, the ideas of, I mean, I don't want to go into it right now. Uh, like in Islam, we have this idea of wahdat al-shuhud and wahdat al-wujud. Um, and, and maybe... Oh, yes, they... yes. That, that particular concept is something that uh, David Bentley Hart speaks about in his... Uh, he has a YouTube lecture out there where he speaks about the experience of God and about how um, he's speaking against new atheists, but that concept is a very um, a prominent one that needs to be looked at. Yeah, very similar to the whole to the whole Sat Chitananda, uh, being consciousness and bliss. Hmm. So it seems to me that uh, you know that at least from the Islamic perspective, it seems that the uh, friendship or alliance between Eastern Orthodox Christianity, especially in Muslims, is uh, almost inevitable at one level because it's mentioned in the Quran, but also. Uh, it's the most natural, but it seems like, mm -hmm. you know, at every moment uh, in the past recent history, at least, uh, well, not even, re I'm talking about from the Ottoman time and then from Soviet time and then afterwards, it seems like, you know, every, so much has been done to almost uh, intentionally move these groups apart from each other. Um, mm -hmm. So I would like to start by mentioning that uh, from what I understand, uh, the Ottomans did hurt a lot of the mm -hmm. Eastern Orthodox Christians. And at least for the Muslim audience here, uh, can you explain maybe from your perspective why uh, that is, that how did the Muslims hurt, how did the Ottomans hurt uh, the Christians? Uh, and, um, and once, you know, because to solve the friendship or the problem we have to first acknowledge the the hurt mm -hmm. and the pain and uh, you know even ask forgiveness and say sorry uh, so anyway do you have something to say about that well um if you uh like maybe there's a there's a little chant there's there's actually a byzantine chant uh called um let me just open it because i can't see the full word um uh, about the fall of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. So because we have a, ch a chant, um, and uh, obviously the, the words we use are very strong. Um, uh, oh Lord, the heathen are come. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's Otheos Elethosan Ethne, that the heathen nations are coming. Um, and this is a, a lament for Constantinople because uh, Constantinople is considered uh, prime amongst the Orthodox churches afforded the ecumenical patriarchate, that bishop is considered the first among equals, hmm. uh, premier inter pares, um, and occupy and is known as the second Rome. Hmm. Uh, uh, we can get it, I don't want to get into the whole issue of how, cons, um, how Cal Chalcedon afforded those uh, lofty terms, but um, Constantin, the fall of Constantinople is completely sad because of the place of prominence it has in the... It's like um, Armaka. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you listen to this chant and you cannot help but feel a sense of sadness. Hmm. Um, and um, this, is, this is sort of how we feel right now as an Orthodox Christian with the Ukrainian-Russian situation that I will not comment on. But um, because now we are saying Orthodox brothers are fighting one another. Mm. Um, there's something that reminds me about the primordial sin between Cain and Abel, mm. um, where Cain kills his brother. And um, uh, but we 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 do um, look upon that as something that I think especially remember a large majority of Eastern Orthodox Christians are from Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Um, and so because maybe not for me, I cannot inherit their pain and feeling, but um, 
for those Christians from those part of the world, the, these kind of things, it does strike a, strike a nerve. Mm. It's like, this is what they've done. You know, this is what they have done to us. And so um, even I think in places like Egypt, where the Egyptian, the Coptic Orthodox Church with the Oriental Orthodox variety um, are being excoriated, um, I, I'm careful to say that Muslims, the Muslims I know, you know, have never done any ill to me. But to my other Christian brothers and sisters, they would see something that I'm doing right now as a betrayal. You, you having tea with a Muslim, you are having lunch with a Muslim. You know, this is, this is because table fellowship is a big thing. Mm. Um, but um, I feel as though in order for this, for this to, to heal, um, and, you know, just like this book, Whatever Christian Needs to Know About the Quran, um, we need to realize that, um, that at, at least from a Christian perspective, um, forgiveness is something that we would, you know, I, I say we should forgive any hurt that is done to us. But because I am not personally someone who has experienced the ostracization, uh, ostracizing effects of Christian Muslim re relationships, I think um, there, there should be room that we should speak about this and we should speak about what um, not, not because this isn't a, a false kind of reconciliation. We need to accept there are things that separate us ideologically. There are things that do. At the same time, though, um, we need to also admit that there are things that that put us uh, make us allies to one another and mm. shouldn't be suspicious. And if correct me if I'm wrong, but the Prophet peace be upon him did have some positive interactions with the Christians in his life. Oh yeah, in, in fact, the, uh, and um, in fact, the Prophet uh, said uh, he said to his companions, uh, "The Christians never betrayed me." Mm -hmm. So he said, always be mindful of that because other communities did betray him in his lifetime. They would make contracts or alliances with him and break it. The pagans did that. The, the Jewish community in Medina did that several times. And uh, when, uh, but with the, uh, the Christians of Najran, for example, and other Christians, uh, when he made contracts with them, they fulfilled them, fulfilled, you know, not siding with someone behind their backs and not fighting against the prophet. Mm -hmm. And so he always said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that be mindful that because they never betrayed me, be nice to them, meaning the Christians. And this is what our prophet taught. And we, we some of our scholars believe that uh, when, uh, when the end times are near, there will come a time where the what we call the Mahdi, somebody from the family of the Prophet, will be a leader of the Muslims. He will give back Hagia Sophia to the Christians, um, and he will let them have that. Uh, and uh, you know, it, of course, in Islamic law, uh, which has um, in Islamic law, there's a lot of rules about when you go to a land, and let's say the whole land has become Muslim, and there's like a church. Uh, you're not allowed, as far as my reading of the issue is concerned, you're not allowed to church, convert a church into a masjid uh, by force. You can drop a church and build a mosque by it, but you're not allowed to kind of like mock it in a sense, oh, we took your church and made it into a mosque. Uh, and uh, uh, this is in case uh, the place where all everybody's become Muslims, there's no one going to the church anymore. And the, the entire environment has become Muslim and there's no one to take care of the church. And the rules are complicated and very much debated. But the principle that's given in Quran, which is that the synagogues and the churches and the masjids, if it was, these are the places where Allah is remembered or God is remembered much. And if it was not for, uh, meaning these are the barriers from causing facade in the world, meaning uh, corruption in the world. So there's a specific verse of the Quran that talks about this. And, uh, and in Islamic law, there's rules about how you have to maintain churches uh, of, of your local areas, how you have to repair them and so on and so forth. So um, 
But the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, we can't treat Hagia Sophia like no matter what the Islamic law is, we can't treat Hagia Sophia like another church that we just happen to come by. You know, this is this is uh, because one of the maqasid of Sharia, one of the five basic principles that the whole of Sharia works on, one of them is the preservation of the people's faith, meaning the Quranic stands on Christianity and Judaism, for example, one, yeah, al-kitab lastum ala shay. Torata wal injil. Oh, people of the book, you have no claim until yourself are practicing your religion. So it's almost like the Quran is telling Christians, be good Christians, or Jews, be good Jews, be real Jews, right? Or be real Christians. And the reason I say this is because part of preservation of faith is you have to, you can't take away people's Makkah. You can't take away their Kaaba. Right? I mean, this is part of the integrity of keeping people's faith. And so uh, I feel, along with uh, other scholars, that there will, inshallah, come a time where Muslims will give back Hagia Sophia to the Eastern Orthodox Christians, and Allah knows best. But this is what we feel. <coughs> it's, uh, it's an interesting, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but and and we believe Jesus will come back, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and and the reason I mentioned that is that uh, we believe that Jesus, uh, when he comes back, he is going to also do justice, mm -hmm. you know, and so, uh, whether uh, the Mahdi will give back the Hagia Sophia or whether if Jesus himself will give back the Hagia Sophia in his, uh, to its, uh, you know, to the Christian world. But we believe that that may be one of the things that will happen. Yeah. Great. 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 So any last words? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I've, I've spoken a lot already, but, um, yeah, I my prayer to God is that um, there will be less heat and more light in Christian Muslim re relations. Um, <laughs> because um, as as much as we like to fight and call each other all sorts of bad names, um, I, I guess uh, if you look outside the atheists to the atheists, we're all the same. They don't they don't really like any of us, and so um, I think. We need to recover the um, the childlikeness of uh, of interaction in the spirit of the two of a very basic commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And um, I think that if sufficient can be put away, we can probably usher in a better age for the for the future generations. And and until until Jesus comes, um, you know, we can foster something you, you know of, of, of goodwill to the world because there, there is a, a passage in scripture where Jesus reprimands uh, the church one of the churches and he says if I come back will there be faith mm. and that's a, that's a that's a very harsh quite statement by Jesus if I come back will there be faith mm. um, and I would hate on the last day on the day of judgment um, for the Messiah <laughs> to disown me in front of God, because mm. that's what Jesus says. I will say, oh, woe unto you. Um, I never knew you. Um, and this is a, th I think this is a, a fear of all Christians not to come to that point where we, um, because I, I believe it was Metropolit Metropolitan Jonah from the Orthodox Church in America that said, um, having doctrine is important, but the thing that Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the, on the Mount is about to be good people, to do good works, to to love your neighbor. Those are the things that he that, that he thinks. Those are the core of what it means to be a Christian. Christian. If I'm debating on Facebook about metaphysical issues and and and, and things like, then then I am just a fool. You know, I'm a foolish man um, because um, there's a passage in the Bible that says, if you have not love you mean nothing. If I spoke the tongues of angels and do not have love, um, have uh, love, you know, 
well, it doesn't mean anything. If I if I prophesy but I have no love, I'm like a clanging symbol, you know, that the, the these kinds of if I give my body to to be burned, you know, and I have no love, it means nothing. Hmm. Um, and so in and so we we have these three virtues, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these are love. We have a hope and anticipation, the glorious hope of the coming of Christ, and we have faith, faith in God. Um, and the thing that I think holds all of those two virtues together as humans is love, uh, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we say, once you have those two things, the, the commandments that God has given to us will follow, will proceed. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Actually, that's very true. Um, uh, one last thing, even though it's kind of like nominal or mundane, but let me ask you this, uh, just for my own interest, you can say, is there a reason why Orthodox Christians have a beard? Um, well, um, I'm going to tell you what I have heard, but um, yeah, there, there's obviously the reason that there, there are certain texts that speak about um, shaving a beard as being for lack of a better term, you are, uh, you know, homosexual, indecent. There are texts that exist like that. And, mm -hmm. um, and then obviously just masculinity. Um, for us, biblical manhood and womanhood is a fundamental part of, um, of, uh, Christi of, of Christianity. Now, in some um, of the Antiochian and Greek churches, you will have be beards that are very more subtle um and so i have to keep mine over this because if i start going beyond the kids are going to start calling me moses believe me that has happened um and uh uh you know uh you know this just look like uh i mean yeah there's a, a lot of discussion about that but there are some other issues relating to uh more christological issues but i mean i i feel as though it would bore you if i told you that but they they are a lot of um reasons uh, why why that happens um yeah uh, a, a beard is seen as a good thing for men a man to have uh, which is why all the oriental and eastern orthodox churches you'll never really see uh, a man clean shaven maybe if he's a normal parishioner but usually a priest is going to have a beard a bishop is going to have a beard uh, uh, let me end with something controversial i don't know what you'll say about it but in Islam, because we believe in having families, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as, depending upon how you define it, but as I'm defining it in my mind, feminism a lot of times runs contrary to the idea of family uh, in some ways, particularly in this one point that I'm about to, because you know, when you're in a family, uh, is it my way or your way? The husband's way or the wife's way right so this would be like a natural conflict um so in islam the quran is very clear that the uh, the um the leadership is given to the man right so the mm -hmm. wife is expected to uh you know kind of like uh, acquiesce uh, to let the man make the mistake he's making and then she can tell him that see i was right but she has to uh kind of give in to her husband to do whatever if he's smart, then he's going to do the smart thing. And if he's not smart, then he's going to do the not so smart thing. And she gets to say, see, I told you, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that the idea that the man is the leader of the household, is that something that you also have in common? With yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, like there are obviously all sorts of other issues, but uh, just on traditional understanding, the, like uh, the man is the priest of his household. Um, he is the one that is leading the family into um, the presence of God in that sense. And so he is the leader. The, we, we say the head of the woman is man. Um, the, the head of Christ is God and the, and the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man. The, the, this this whole dynamic and just to such an extent that um, and there, there are some scholars out there that 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 resist with rigor that concept that only but tri like fr according to the official stance of the church, um, only women can, um, women cannot be priests. Um, mm. This is reserved for the men. So just like and women some other, be imams yeah. or a she, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Scholars, that, that would be can't do that. The, would be um, yeah, yeah. And so um, yeah, there, 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 there's that issue, and um, 
Yeah, so men, the, the Bible does say a uh, woman uh, submit to your husbands, but then it also gives some, it kind of gives this this nudge and says, and women, uh, men love your wives, right, husbands right. love your wives. Yeah. So it's like, you're not getting out. And in, in fact, uh, it even says, and fathers do not exasperate your children. Mm. So um, just because the man is the head, um he it doesn't mean that he can just do do whatever he wants to because god holds him to a higher standard um, yeah and which i think is that's why like part of the global culture the liberal culture it's almost assumed that if you have authority that you're going to abuse it right and uh yeah and i mean to give you a bit of an idea um if you ask any priest if he wants to become a bishop um he'll be like why do you hate me <laughs> um, because this this idea this idea of a of a bishop is uh, is a burden um to be a father to many to uh to to be a leader to many churches and stuff and um it it's like no 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 i'm 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 saying in fact some of the fathers i think it was chrysostom he ran away from uh <laughs> from being wanting to be a, 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 a bishop he was like no 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 i'm not i i i think you got the wrong guy i think you got the wrong guy and um in in fact saint isaac the syrian uh, he actually is always depicted as having a turban on his head interestingly enough with saint isaac of syria so in isaac of, of syria i think he left the he left the episcopacy to go back to a life of monasticism because it wasn't for him Mm -hmm. um and so um the obviously leadership and stuff isn't seen flippantly um some people don't want to uh and actually to be an orthodox husband or orthodox leader of any kind is not a not an e easy thing you held to a to a very high standard mm. so yes yeah, so that's another mashallah good uh commonality okay yeah. i think uh that was good alhamdulillah um so Inshallah, if Allah wills, we'll have another program at some point uh, soon, inshallah. Um, inshallah. So thank you for coming, uh, you know, and I really appreciate it. I'm thankful that Allah made us connect. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, inshallah, people, both Christians and Muslims, will benefit from this conversation, inshallah. I hope so too. Yep, inshallah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.